gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome Juan Coyar uh, here to Brown. Um, Juan and I are contemporaries in every sense of the word. We, um, we were graduate students at a very similar time, and we've actually started in a very similar area for the uh, ensuing 30 or 20-something 20, 20 years. No, um, 30 something. Don't don't worry, don't 30 uh, something. Yeah, all right. It is. Don't pretend. So, so <laughs> I'm in denial. So, um, uh, um, one started his work um, uh, uh, with Frank Avignoni uh, south in South Carolina. Um, my first descriptions of uh, 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 one was actually him performing an experiment uh, deep underground a uh, germanium-based experiment deep underground, actually in the lab adjacent to the lab that I'm using, uh, along with my team and many other research groups for a dark matter experiment. They, they had actually taken up residence, and when I call it a lab, technically it was actually a sort of five foot by five foot by about three foot hole in the wall. In the wall. <laughs> um, and I do remember hearing that... Um, Ventilation in underground labs is absolutely crucial. Um, but in this case, because it was such a small lab, it didn't have anything which you would describe. So they, they would quite literally have to work uh, with relatively little clothing on. And there were one or two, uh, <laughs> one, or, one, or two, one or two, a lot of gossip used to go around the, um, you know, the miners in the, uh, about, <laughs> about what physicists were getting up to. Uh, Don't go into the details, uh, really, no, no. please. But uh, anyway, but it, uh, just to we're show you the links we're as we're a graduate student to which, we're uh, being recorded. which, <laughs> which one would go to. Anyway, that's right. This is a, fa this is a family show. So a a anything, I, anything I've got on him, he's got three times worse on me, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, and you think I'm joking. No, he actually has the oh photographic yes. evidence. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, I'm going to be nice about him. Um, but uh, sorry, so after uh, 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 that work on the, on the germanium detects double beta decay uh, with a side order of dark matter, um, uh, he went on to... Uh, CERN, uh, where he was involved in look or really getting together this novel way of looking for solar axions, the cast experiment in particular that many of it was, it was you know, really the first of these generation of experiments where they were reusing magnets from, uh, was the it UA? Yeah, the, it UA was the very, very first uh, test magnet. Yeah. Right, test, you know, the test magnets. You, you basically using the very high intensity magnetic field in order to convert. Uh, axions as they came from the sun and then go on to detect the electromagnetic uh, excitation as it were in the, in the field that that would create. So from, uh, 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 from there uh, one went on to Paris where in fact they started and I do remember the palpable excitement uh, when I went to visit him and he I think you would really just zeroed in on this um, uh, su you know using superheated uh, liquids in the form of, I think back then, droplets, and then moved on to the sort of superheated, you know, bubble chamber-like approach that we're going to hear about. Um, and it is, it was, it was a very novel, completely left field, which is something one's extremely good at, <laughs> um, uh, you know, way of pushing into an entirely new type of detector for dark matter. Uh, with, with a sort of sensitivity that was, uh, and has indeed, as you'll see from the talk, become absolutely uh, world-leading. So, uh, and from there, of course, Juan went on to uh, Chicago, where he is now a professor. And what they've really been able to do, and this is as well as, obviously, you know, using these, these low-energy detectors for dark matter, they have also now been able to make the world's first measurement of coherent neutrino scattering. It's a, it's a phenomena that, you know, in weak interaction physics, we, we had every reason to believe would be there, but because of the extremely low energies uh, involved, w had, has been, um, you know, for the last 50 years plus of the weak uh, interactions really being understood, that uh, we've been striving to actually demonstrate, and he's gonna get a chance you know, many congratulations on doing that, uh, you know, to talk about that, uh, you know, that work. Thank Great. you. Well, thank you, Rick. Um, so uh, I, I hope to cover two experiments in one talk. And uh, in order to do that, I needed to find some sort of a 
nexus between them. So what I really want to tell you is, uh, well, that's the subtitle, uh, how uh, some of the techniques, some of the lessons we have learned in developing uh, dark matter detectors, uh, detectors sensitive to weakly interactive massive particles, we have now applied to neutrino physics. I mean, really the reason or uh, it is thanks to the expertise developed over the last 30 some years in, in looking for WIMPs that we were able to uh, apply the techniques to neutrino physics. And what I hope to communicate towards the end of my talk is how in order to, to do neutrino physics of interest with uh, coherent neutrino scattering, we're going to have to uh, really apply ourselves in understanding the response of these detectors to these low energy nuclear recoils. So what are those? What are low energy nuclear recoils? They're sort of an old shoe, as I say here. It is actually the, the means through which uh, Chadwick discovered the neutron. Maybe one day we'll regard WIMPs or neutrinos as something as mundane as we look at the neutron nowadays. But the truth of the matter is it took him about 20 years to demonstrate that this, were, this was a new type of emission and not high energy gammas as it was suspected they might be at the time. And uh, to cut a long story short, essentially what he developed was the techniques to produce nuclear recoils to have these neutrons impact on paraffin in this case and create a recoiling hydrogen a uh, recalling proton that uh, he could identify as such, and it took a lot of in ingenuity. Um, microscopically speaking, a low, low energy nuclear recoil is the outcome of the impact of a projectile, in this case a W for a WIMP, a, a hypothetical dark matter particle, or a neutron, it might be, a fast neutron, uh, that hits the nucleus and displaces it. The way I describe this to my students is uh, it's very much like the opening of a game of pool. Uh, when you start the game, the, the white ball will strike the first one in this triangular array that would be your primary recoil. And then immediately what follows is a rucus, a high concentration of energy. Uh, the energy is very rapidly dispersed uh, through secondary recoils with the rest of the billiard balls. We have the same thing happening microscopically, and that actually makes these nuclear recoils sort of characteristic and different from other types of radiations that in our experiments were not really interested in detecting. So here is a little diagram. Notice the scale here. This is just 500 Armstrongs on the side. And uh, if a WIMP or a neutron or a neutrino came and scattered elastically off an iodine nucleus in this compound, which is one we have used in our bubble chambers, and imparted just about 10 keV, a small energy, typical of what we expect from these interactions, to that iodine, the primary recoil, the iodine would move from here to there following that reddish uh, line. And what you see is that in its wake along its tra trajectory, it's displacing uh, the other species, uh, carbon, fluorine, other, or, uh, other iodines. And at the end, the energy is dissipated within this very small box cell. If you were to give or impart 10 keV of energy to an electron, the electron wouldn't be able to, not being massive enough, it wouldn't be able to displace other uh, display is a nuclei this way and it would just zoom out of the screen and follow a trajectory much longer in range and it would leave those 10 keV of energy over a much uh, much larger uh, volume or, or distance. So these microscopic mechanisms of course we know about and we try to exploit to identify, positively identify, discriminate if you want nuclear recoils from all other kinds of interactions. This is fundamental, especially when, you, when you're looking for dark matter interactions because there's so many other known particles that produce electron recoils and other types of interactions that we're really not interested in detecting. We want to throw those event out, uh, events out and only keep uh, this sort of stuff. When uh, you animate this movie, if I can do that, um, uh, there it is, then um, it's just five or six of these uh, examples with the same energy, and you can see that it's highly reproducible. The, the energy concentration is, is very, very high. This energy concentration is what we exploit in the pico bubble chambers uh, to identify or, or uh, separate these nuclear recoils from uh, just about anything else. Uh, bubble chambers were dominant for many years in particle physics, and they were used at high degrees of superheat meaning that the liquid was rather unstable. And back then you could do this because uh, the bubble chamber was in a beam path and people knew when the signals would be appearing. Uh, 
So it was, it was uh, enough to keep this liquid highly superheated for just a few milliseconds at a time and then take images of the trajectories of these minimum ionizing particles in there uh, just at the right time of, of, of the expected interactions. In order to look for dark matter, since you don't have the privilege of knowing when the signals are coming, you have to make the bubble chambers much more stable for a much longer period of time. Uh, so I when we started working in this area, we essentially figure out the techniques to, to have what nowadays are essentially indefinitely superheated liquids waiting for the occasional nuclear recoil. And what helps you there is that in order to see nuclear recoils, you don't have to superheat the liquid nearly as much as what you would do to see this muscular uh, track from a cosmic uh, ray, a muon going through. It's enough to just superheat the liquid ever so slightly to have it close to the liquid phase and then it's only the high concentrations of energy from nuclear recoils that I just showed you that produce isolated bubbles, each one corresponding to an episode of, of a nuclear recoil taking place. So this is what you would see if a neutron came through and scattered with a mean free path of order a few centimeters, find its way out of the chamber. And this is what you might expect to see from a weakly interacting massive particle. The probability of interaction here is so small that if you're lucky, you're just gonna get one interaction and one interaction only. So as you can see, there's the possibility of distinguishing n even neutrons from uh, WIMPs in such devices. Uh, this is uh, kind of long uh, to explain, but this is just the theory, the, th the theory of operation of uh, uh, bubble chambers. And we, we use the same theory that uh, uh, described their operation uh, during the era when they were uh, dominant in particle physics. Uh, essentially what it tells you is that you have to meet two conditions. A particle has to meet two conditions to produce a bubble. You have to deposit a minimum of energy and you have to deposit it in a concentrated enough fashion. The, the, the DE, DX, the stopping power, the constant or, or energy loss per unit distance has to be large enough that the energy is locally available to be converted into heat of vaporization, etc. So uh, those two thresholds in, in a plot like this where you have the stopping power versus the energy of the particle define an upper right quadrant, which is where you expect to see bubbles. So if a wimp came and imparted a few kV of energy to an iodine nucleus, like in the movie I showed you before, as the iodine nucleus uh, slows down through the material, it would trace this trajectory. And you can see that for a certain range, it would, it would be able to produce bubbles. Electrons, on the other hand, if you're wise and you choose the pressure and operating temperature wisely, uh, uh, cannot uh, give you nucleations. This is expressed in this plot where you see the, the number of gamma interactions producing electron recoils that you require in order to see a single bubble. These are calibrations, these are, these are data that are uh, measured directly, not, not the result of a calculation or anything like that. But you can see that you require of the order of 10 to the 10 uh, electron recoils before you see a single bubble. And this is a sort of uh, background discrimination that you require in this game of, of looking for these very rare uh, dark matter interactions. I want to, there's many other aspects that were described in the previous transparency about the virtues of this technique. But I, I, today I want to concentrate on some, some of the most interesting, if to, to my taste, the most interesting one, which is something we only started doing recently, which is to exploit the acoustic emission from a rapidly expanding bubble. Uh, there's another energy term that is not described here, which is the sound that is emitted as this bubble uh, progresses in its evolution from you know something of the order of a few tens of nanometers, the size of the protobubble, initial protobubble, to a macroscopic bubble that you can take photographs of. Um, is nothing new if, uh, if I were to demonstrate a superheated liquid here in, in the room, and this can be done with some of these bubble detectors that are used for neutron dosimetry. Uh, if we were to heat one of those up in, in a bath of water, you would hear from quite an, a good distance of a, of a few meters, you would be able to hear these high-pitched sounds that Glaser, the inventor of the bubble chamber, called plinks because that's exactly how they sound. They, they sound like a plink, you know, very high pitched. Most of the emission is at very high frequencies outside of, the, of our hearing range. And he would put a photon, phonograph pickup against the glassware of the bubble chambers and that sound 
as registered by the phonograph pickup would, would trigger the photography in the earliest bubble chambers. Years later, we got some theoretical predictions that said you might be able or you should be able to exploit this acoustic emission to do particle identification. This, this sound carries some information about, for instance, the range of the particle. An alpha particle can produce single bubbles in our devices, but an alpha has a range of tens of microns. The nuclear recoils we're looking for uh, also give us a single bubble, but the range is tens of nanometers. So you see that there's several orders of magnitude in range, which means that for the alpha, you have several protobubbles expanding initially, and each one of those is a source of sound. Uh, so this is some effect that was uh, discovered by our colleagues from the Picasso collaboration. We are now all merged together into the same uh, same uh, collaboration. Uh, and then, then in, in bubble chambers, we saw so much better. So here you have a histogram of it's a logarithmic scale of AP. AP stands for acoustic parameter. And it's a, it's a rudimentary measure of, uh, rudimentary measure of uh, loudness for the sound emission. Uh, we do some corrections for the position of the bubble with respect to the piezoelectric sensors that pick up the sound. You can see some of those piezos here attached to the glassware, some of the traces we register. And, uh, um, it is, it is rather rudimentary in the sense that we're only measuring loudness in a, in a narrow uh, frequency band, okay? But you can see that when we put a neutron source next to the detector producing nuclear recoils, short range nuclear recoils, we produce a histogram that is arbitrarily normalized around zero here. You do see some alphas during the time it takes to do these calibrations. It takes a couple of days, so some of the alphas naturally occurring show up as well. But then during a physics run, when we're looking for dark matter, when we're hoping to see nuclear recoils like, the, like this produced by a calibration source, um, what you see is exclusively alphas. And you see those two peaks here. Uh, this is something that we just started to do recently. We are actually able to do acoustic calorimetry. These are alphas with an energy of the order of 6 MeV. Those are alphas with an energy of the order of 8 MeV. And we know this because we have a separate handle that comes from the timing of the decays in the radon 222 chains that, that or are the origin of these uh, alphas that tell us which is which. So uh, this is rather amusing. I mean, we've been fascinating by, fascinated by all this, but we're starting to scratch the surface. The, the, this, this acoustic emission is incredibly rich in information. For instance, if we concentrate on these three alphas emitted by a radon 222 decay, one of them has an energy of five and a half MeV, the other six, and the last one about eight MeV. If we collect a few hundred of those events and we find their average uh, power spectrum, this is this AP parameter, the loudness versus frequency in this case, what we see is extraordinarily different clear signatures that we don't start to understand at this point in time. that we don't know how the, this is, this is, these things are, there's harmonics in there and, you know, what's happening microscopically is different. Uh, how, much uh, how much variability do you get? Is it there about so it's indicative? These, these are the sum of about a few hundred events each. So the error bars are really the statistical. But it's, it looks just statistical. It doesn't look like the physics process is moving around. No, no, and these things have essentially the same spatial distribution in the chamber. Uh, so. All of these effects we have isolated. So this is real. This is some microscopic difference between these alphas expressing itself as, a, as, an, acoustic, uh, as, a, as an acoustic signature that we are not exploiting yet. So we, we, we want to start to do that. And uh, our present piezoelectric transducers are not optimized to, to, uh, uh, to profit from this for reasons of their uh, aspect ratio, the, the, the size of the piezoelectric element and the electronics we use, we have essentially no emission above a few tens of kilohertz. There's some very basic arguments that tell you that as the bubble progresses in size, the dominant frequency emitted in the form of sound uh, should depend on, 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 the, on the dimensions of the bubble in a rather uh, trivial way. And uh, what this is telling you is that if you want to go backwards in time to earlier stages of bubble development, uh, you should be going higher in frequency. So we're now, for instance, developing new P 
piezo transducers that give us uh, uh, sensitivity out to a few tens of megahertz. Anything beyond that, we expect attenuation to to keep it from keep keep those frequencies from reaching the piezos. Okay, so we, we have about three orders of magnitude of terra incognita that we want to start exploring to look for more acoustic signatures. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. Something else that we only started to do recently is to exploit uh, neural networks to uh, identify these patterns. As, as you know, neural networks are the tool of choice when you want to extricate patterns out of complex patterns out of information, sometimes in a rather obscure way. Sometimes you have to develop techniques to look inside the mind of the neural network and figure out what is it that, what are those patterns that it identified. We've done some of that. I'm going to show you. But anyway, in our latest paper, we, we saw these neural networks working very, very well. And all we feed the neural network is, well, I said all we feed, but what we feed is all of the information we have. We have uh, three piezoelectric sensors in this case, uh, eight frequency bands, and then the position of the bubble. Uh, we do training of the network with calibration sources, and uh, then uh, we develop a very simple uh, uh, network that tells us if what happened in there is an alpha or a nuclear recoil. We now want to extend this to identifying electron recoils as well, and just about anything else we can do. There's very recent uh, evidence from our collaborators in Montreal that, for instance, we can already di differentiate a carbon or fluorine recoil from a hydrogen recoil acoustically. Okay? So this is extremely promising. This is what I was mentioning before. It's sometimes hard to figure out what, uh, what uh, weights were assigned to these connections between your, uh, the layers in your, in your neural network. And uh, there are techniques that we can use to take a peek, to peer into the mind of this uh, network. And when you do so, what you realize is that the network identified the same patterns uh, in the three microphones, in this case, in the three piezoelectric sensors. And these sort of correlations are not only the same across the microphones, but stuff that you and I, by, by observing events, would never be able to figure it out. So, as I suggest here, you better surrender to your robot overlords because they're coming. Uh, I'm a believer by now that uh, this is the future. Some uh, results from this effort. Uh, this is the largest chamber we have built so far. We call it Pico 60. It, uh, uh, we were able to put up to 60 liters of superheated liquid in, in there. Uh, and it ran at Sudbury. Uh, which is another underground facility this time in Canada. Uh, we did, uh, we ran a blind analysis this last time around. We blinded all of the acoustics, which are at the end what tells us which, which uh, type of radiations we're looking at. And uh, there were only three events that passed all cats, and luckily there were multiples. So these are clearly neutrons, certainly not WIMPs. So we ended up with a zero background experiment that led us to the best sensitivity in, uh, for spin-dependent couplings. In this field, we talk about, well, just by now, a, a number of couplings that we can expect between these WIMPs and, and the nuclei. And in our case, because we have fluorine in our compounds, we are very sensitive to uh, spin-dependent couplings with the protons uh, in fluorine, or the odd proton in fluorine. And uh, that gives us a little bit of an extra edge. These are predictions from supersymmetric models that we are now starting to explore rather uh, efficiently, as you can see. Um, in the next slide, the next, I threw out a bunch of slides because I know you, you like this to run on a 50-minute basis, and that's my, my goal. But there's one that I couldn't bring myself to throw out, uh, and I kept it in, in, in homage uh, to Rick. Because Rick is actually, Rick was the first person to, to show the world a, a plot like this. He, he was very fond of uh, showing the evolution of the sensitivity of different techniques as a function of uh, time. So in this one, uh, prepared by Andrew, if you want to blame anyone, uh, blame Andrew Sonnenschein. Uh, what you can see is comparing apples to apples, comparing spin-dependent limits, the evolution in time of liquid xenon-based detectors and the evolution in time of uh, uh, bubble chambers. And I don't know if you can do second derivatives by eyeball, but I can. And I do see a convex and a concave curve. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> This one is for you, Rick. Uh, you know, I, 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 I knew you would appreciate this plot. Anyway, so we're, we're picking up speed. We're now designing new styles of bubble chamber where we do without this water buffer that has given us trouble in the past by oxidizing the, the steel. So now we have this uh, right side up design where there's only superheated liquid up here. And then in the parts that come in contact with uh, metals, with porous materials where you could have spontaneous nucleations, we have a gradient of temperature, and uh, what we have is a, is a cold liquid in there that is in the liquid phase that is stable. Okay? So uh, uh, just as we run out of funding in this country to do any of this, uh, fortunately there's been a rainfall of funding in Canada, uh, and uh, uh, we got PICO 500 funded earlier this year. Uh, we're about to take over one of the large tanks in, in Sudbury, and uh, the funding for construction will become available uh, mid-2018. This is the end of the road for us. We, we, don't, expect, we don't expect to go, uh, I'm personally not going to try to build a larger bubble chamber, but uh, perhaps you can see, well, I didn't put Pico 500 here, but essentially it's going to give us another, a little bit more than another order of magnitude in reach, which for us, what it will do is essentially prove the supersymmetric models very efficiently through the spin-dependent coupling. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about the second second part of the, the talk, which is how we have uh, employed some of these techniques used to calibrate and understand the response of dark matter detectors, uh, uh, the response to low-energy nuclear recoils to neutrino physics. What we've been able to do recently, as you probably uh, heard about, is to measure the exact same process, the production of a low energy nuclear recoil, but this time coming from a low energy neutrino. Okay? Uh, and what's special or, or characteristic about this mechanism is that the cross section, the probability of interaction, is actually much, much larger than for any other neutrino uh, coupling that we know of. This uh, inverse beta decay is actually the way that neutrinos uh, were discovered. And you can see that coherent elastic scattering uh, of neutrinos of nuclei is about two orders of magnitude more probable. From now on, I'm going to stick to, uh, I will start to say sevens. Sevens starts, uh, stands for coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering. And it's ca quite a mouthful, so we like to call it sevens, OK? Um, so it has the largest cross-section, and it was proposed some 43 years ago. And because of the magnitude of this cross-section, you can start to build truly miniature neutrino detectors, at least for some neutrino sources. They have to be intense, of course. Um, why did it take so long? It was proposed by Daniel Friedman, and in his original 1974 paper, uh, he actually called his proposal perhaps a, an act of hubris. Uh, because certainly at the time, if you went and you're a theoretician and you ask your experimental colleagues, how do you detect uh, nuclear recoils with energies of a few keV, at the time they would have a belly laugh. It's, you know, it's, they would tell you it's very, very hard. We have some uh, such detectors for neutrons, but they only operate at higher energies. What came along some 30 years ago is the interest in developing these devices for dark matter detection. And that's why we've been able to finally pull it off. A number of other things fell in, in place, of course. But uh, coherent neutrino nucleus scattering sevens, uh, what it tells you is that if the energy of the neutrino is low enough so that the momentum transfer is modest enough that this relationship here in natural units between the momentum transfer and the radius of the nucleus is preserved, then you are going to be probing the whole nucleus simultaneously. You are not interacting with isolated nucleons any longer. You're just kicking the whole nucleus as a whole. And that produces the nuclear recoil, which is the problem. The reason why it took 43 years uh, to do this, the energies of these recoils are very, very small in this case for the coherence condition to be preserved. Um, it's interesting to observe that some of the earliest proposals for dark matter detectors that we use nowadays came or were motivated by sevens and nothing else. This is the original paper by Blas Cabrera and company 
where the super CDMS detectors or bolometers are described for the first time. And what's interesting is that you will not find any mention of dark matter here. It's strictly about detecting sevens, and later on they figured that it was easier to uh, go detect dark matter. So that gives you a feeling for uh, the, the, the level of difficulty involved. In the 43 years, we had a lot of uh, suggestions of what to do with sevens. If you are able to exploit this uh, mechanism, the sort of interesting studies in neutrino physics that you could do with such a detector. The list is long, and I'm just going to mention a, a couple of my favorite. One is uh, uh, if you were to see neutrino oscillations with a detector sensitive to this mechanism, you would come as close as possible to direct evidence for sterile neutrinos. And the reason for that is that the cross-section is essentially the same for all of, all of the known um, neutrino flavors. This is a neutral process, a neutral current process, and therefore the, the, the differences are, are very, very tiny. So if you get to see significant neutrino oscillations, it means that those oscillations have to be into steroids. Um, another one that I will end up by mentioning uh, in my last few slides is the studies of electromagnetic properties of neutrinos. Uh, sevens is, is a beautiful mechanism to try to improve our sensitivity to neutrino magnetic moments, uh, etc. Milli charged neutrinos, so on and fo so forth. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there's been, there was plenty of time to talk about uh, what would you do with a miniature neutrino detector. And some of these proposals are kind of crazy, and uh, I mentioned them here uh, just in passing, but uh, clearly, uh, you know, it, it'd be kind of hard to exploit neutrinos to something like this, uh, planetary tomography, geological prospection, etc. But one that is essentially around the corner is to come up with highly deployable, very compact neutrino detectors that are able to monitor through the neutrino flux uh, what's going on inside a power reactor. It's relatively easy for a reactor operator to declare usage of the reactor that does not correspond to what's happening in there and to start uh, creating fish, you know, uh, weapons-grade material, so all sorts of naughty things. So there's a big interest in uh, from the uh, uh, non-proliferation uh, national security uh, community on, on a compact neutrino detector that you can impose uh, through international treaties, etc., on uh, uh, reactor operators to, to monitor at the level of few percent what the flux is, and that will tell you exactly what's going on inside the core. This is just my take on Leo Stodolsky's neutrino radio. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we seem to have forgotten about the the emitter to go with the receiver, but uh, anyway, one day we can we can come up with a, a nice uh, emitter. We'll we'll pro Carlo Rubio probably yes. Well, anyway, I saw Carlo the other day. I I, I hid from Carlo the other day. Uh, I didn't dare to show up. Uh, I saw him from a distance. We worked together when I when I was at CERN. Anyway, I'm sure Carlo would have something to say about that. Uh, now, the, when you think about detecting sevens, the first thing that comes to mind is, is going to a reactor, a power reactor, because the, the flux of neutrinos that you get uh, some 20 meters away is exceptional. It's, uh, it's just about the largest, uh, uh, the most intense uh, man-made neutrino source we can think of. The problem with those is that their energies are low enough, of course, to produce uh, coherent interactions but they lead themselves to very low energy nuclear recoils. Most of them, regardless of the material you use in, the, in your detector, are going to be sub kV, which is hard to do. Okay? That didn't stop some of us. Uh, we are not the only people to have tried this at that reactor. As an experimentalist, this was uh, San Onofre uh, before they closed up. And we spent a year down there in these tendon galleries uh, trying to uh, to see sevens with, in this case, p-type point contact germanium detectors. Uh, as an experimentist, I, I can tell you that this was the closest I've come to a, an exercise in pure misery. Uh, we uh, had something like 15% lifetime. We had to distill our own liquid nitrogen out of thin air, quite literally, because this is it's a condenser, uh, because there was no permission to bring uh, cryogens down there. We communicated with the experiment through this object here, strictly through that. But we did have a lot of time, a lot of fun with the 
acronyms at least. Uh, this is what we got out of this effort. According to Giorgio Grata, uh, we were the first to put the sense, uh, seven signal and backgrounds on a linear, linear plot. This is, this is the signal and this is the backgrounds and this here, this towering massive thing is what we call the pedestal. This is when you run into the noise of, of your detector. And uh, we, we had brought down this noise by an order of magnitude, but you can see that it was clearly not enough. We came close, but no cigar. Background-wise, we did very well, but you, uh, we were missing a factor of a few before we could see the signal coming on when the reactor is operating and going away when they, when they turn it off. This technique, these P-type point contact detectors, have actually evolved now to the to the point that just the other day, for instance, there was a, a, a paper out by a Chinese uh, group using them to look for dark matter, and they have reduced uh, the threshold to uh, uh, essentially 160 electron volts. So it is, it, we're getting to the point where one starts to think this could be possible at a reactor. Now, fortunately, well, before I talk about all the sources of neutrinos, I should tell you that there's right now an ongoing effort in Germany to redo this, to redo essentially what we tried in San Onofre with P-type point contact detectors. Two efforts uh, in the U.S. to do the same using the super CDMS detectors that I mentioned at the experimental reactors in this case. And then one in Brazil and another one in Germany. And these two, I'm ready to bet, my money is on these two. These detectors are probably going to see within the next couple of years sevens from reactor neutrinos. Now what's lovely about them is that this, in this case you have arrays that can be mass produced, we're told, of uh, tiny little uh, bolometers. Uh, here you have these ultra low noise uh, CCD cameras and effectively they have a zero threshold. This, this pedestal that I showed you before, the smallest energy you can detect before you run into noise, for those detectors is essentially down to zero, meaning that they will be able to see these towering signals and these are truly compact detectors. These are fist size detectors that we'll be able to, we will be able to use if we want, if we choose to, to monitor the activity of, of reactors. So neutrino technologies are about to take place through the detection of sevens. Now, uh, what I was starting to say a, a second ago is that fortunately we do have other options available to us. Neutrino, I mean, uh, reactors are not the only neutrino source uh, available. Uh, you do have spallation sources like the SNS at Oak Ridge National Lab where what you're trying to produce is neutrons in the first place. These are the, the SNS is the most intense uh, neutron source in the world. Uh, uh, but fortunately, uh, there's also quite a, quite a production of uh, neutrinos of different flavors at the end of these uh, uh, reactions. So the SNS is producing 10 to the 20 two neutrons per day, but it's also producing about 10 to the 20 neutrinos per day. And we're able to get very close to the target. Uh, and here's this, this plot shows you the, what you gain and what you lose. What you lose is a lot of flux. This is from reactors, power reactors. You can see that the flux is much lower, but you also gain in neutrino energy. These energies are still able to give you full coherence over nuclei. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the recoil energies that you're going to produce are a little bit higher. So the effort is not as desperate as, a, as in a reactor from the point of view of detecting these tiny signals. Something else that is nice uh, in spallation sources of neutrinos is that they're typically pulse, and that tells you when the signals should be expected. So we, we, we have a triggering signal that we can use to look at what's happening in our detectors there. And uh, we expect the neutrinos uh, to follow different temporal patterns. Uh, we also, of course, know what the energies of those neutrinos uh, should be. You can see them here. So we can generate predictions for how the seven signals should look like that uh, uh, are characteristic not only in energy, but also in time. And this is what allowed us to pull the signal out of the backgrounds very nicely. So by knowing when the signals are coming, we, the, the backgrounds are reduced by this rather gigantic factor. You wish you had that when you're looking for dark matter. So uh, we, we have been using uh, techniques down there at uh, the SNS uh, typical of uh, dark matter detection. Essentially, every single detector that you see here 
These are the P-type point contact detectors, different types of scintillators. This is the one that gave us the first detection. Liquid argon, uh, we have tried liquid xenon, like uh, Rick is using for dark matter detection, okay? And uh, there's a number of goals we have set for ourselves. The first two we have accomplished with the first measurement already. And one thing we still have to do is to observe the dependence of the sevens cross-section on the square of the number of neutrons in the, in the nucleus. This is the, the enhancement to the cross-section uh, coming from co coherence. It's that n square factor. And for that, of course, you need to see the process with more targets. And that's what we're hoping to do next. Uh, there's a battery of detectors down there. There's a rather sizable liquid argon detector that is looking, starting to look very promising after some upgrades. Liquid argon has been used uh, uh, in dark matter searches and a number of other devices that we uh, that are either starting to take data or, or about to be implemented. So let me tell you uh, about the measurement a little bit. Um, and I should be done in about 10 minutes. Uh, why did we use cesium iodine? Uh, in a sense, we kind of broomed ourselves or mopped ourselves into a corner. We, we knew the, the structure of our uh, neutrino flux very well, as I showed you a minute ago. And then thinking about that source of neutrinos and that source of neutrinos only, we tried to select the type of detector that would do the best possible job. And it turned out to be a rather mundane scintillator that has been around forever, for a number of decades, cesium iodine sodium doped. What's immediately noticeable is that cesium and iodine are large. They are so large that they are actually on, on each side of xenon in, in uh, the uh, table of elements and therefore this enhancement to the cross-section is large. Because they are not so different in mass, you expect to see the same response to the neutrinos, and that helps you understand your device. If they were very dissimilar in mass, it would take a lot more work to figure out how much light is emitted by a sodium uh, recoil and an iodine recoil, if, for instance, this was sodium iodine. Um, and a number of other reasons that could be listed. But th this plot I want to call your attention to. This is perhaps the reason why it took 43 years to see this process. You cannot just say, oh, I'm going to put the, a, a detector uh, with a very large uh, nucleus in there, and that's going to make the cross-section so large I'll get to see this process. There is, there is a trade-off built in that is rather tricky, and uh, I want you to appreciate. This inset here shows you the number of events you should expect at the SNS from sevens as a function of the detector threshold, as a function of the smallest energy you can detect with that device. And what you see is that if you want to use something heavy like uh, cesium or xenon, this is the sort of curve that generates, in order to get a large number of events, you need to push the threshold down by a lot. If you stay with something lighter, then perhaps you are in a better situation if uh, you cannot push the threshold down so much. In other words, you use a, a large nucleus, you get a large enhancement to the cross-section, but you also get a much lower maximum recoil energy that you can impart to that heavy nucleus. And that quid pro quo, that trade-off, is what actually made this hard to, to take place, okay? So from cesium iodine sodium dope, we got uh, essentially everything we needed. The choice of the dopant sodium looks kind of strange to those of you who have heard of cesium iodine. The standard cesium iodine uses thallium as a dopant, and that's in order to quench this phosphorescence, this afterglow that we get after a cosmic muon goes through the crystal, which in an experiment close to the surface, uh, as we are in the SNS, is happening continuously, several times per second. So attention to details, we also had to choose the dopant, otherwise the experiment would have been impossible. Um, we look before we jump, we uh, work with a prototype, a two kilogram prototype, as opposed to the 14 kilogram detector that did the job at the end. Uh, for a couple of years in Chicago, we built a shielding uh, essentially identical to the one we brought to the SNS. Uh, we operated under a similar modest overburden of eight uh, meters of water equivalent. Uh, we made sure that the backgrounds we could get uh, uh, were low enough that we would get to see the signal, the seventh signal at the SNS. We had the pleasant surprise that through the addition of 
extra shielding around the detector. And I insist, all of these techniques of shielding detectors are is stuff we have learned from working in, in dark matter detectors. By adding a little bit of extra shielding and by also uh, understanding our low energy backgrounds and how to reject them a little bit better, we had the pleasant surprise of seeing a, a, an actual background at the SNS lower than during the tests in Chicago. Not by much, but it, it certainly helped. We also were convinced through a battery of measurements using neutron detectors that no uh, neutrons from the SNS could get to us in this hiding place where we had put all of these detectors. Uh, I think I flashed this slide before. We are in a in a corridor that we call the neutrino alley. And the SNS target, the mercury target, is over here. And what we enjoy is about 20 meters of uninterrupted neutron shielding. So we did uh, studies over a few months of the neutron flux, very tiny flux that we measure at the position of the detector. Uh, this looks like a big peak, but it's just one event per day. And uh, we worried about other more exotic backgrounds, such as the um, uh, neutrino-induced neutrons in the lead shielding that you put to shield against gamma, environmental gammas, so on and so forth. We grew convinced that these beam-related backgrounds are negligible. I'll show you how, how negligible they are in a second. We characterized the detectors uh, to establish the cuts that we used in a blind analysis. We eventually perform. We measured the uh, light yield uniformity out of this crystal uh, to make sure that from different parts of the scintillator, we're seeing the same emission of light uh, for a fixed uh, energy deposition. And this particular one, I want to concentrate for a second. What we had to do, which is strictly in common with uh, dark matter searches, we also had to measure this so-called quenching factor. The quenching factor is the fraction of the energy that in the case of a scintillator is emitted as light for a nuclear recoil when you compare it with the flash of light generated by an electron recoil of the same energy. The additional difficulty in, in seeing sevens is the fact that, as you can see, nuclear recoils are rather inefficient in producing something you can measure. Light in this case, ionization in a germanium detector. Okay, uh, So that makes things even harder. Not only you're trying to find low energy nuclear recoils, they do produce much less uh, ionization or scintillation than uh, an electron of the same energy. So this was done at Tunnel uh, in North Carolina. We performed a couple of measurements there. Within the collaboration, we're performing a third one because the detector keeps taking data, and we want to reduce the uncertainty. But essentially, this is, this is the uh, uh, value that we adopted in the energy region of interest for sevens. It's not too bad. Certainly for the world of dark matter studies, this is, this is tolerable uncertainty. Installation of the detector, etc., uh, with again some techniques inherited from dark matter searches. This polyethylene here is there to uh, knock down in energy the neutrons that are produced uh, uh, by neutrino interactions, in this case in the lead. Muon vitos, active and passive shieldings, all of these techniques are inherited from the world of wind detection. The copper that you see the detector being made of is electroform copper, just like the one we use in cryostats to uh, build dark matter detectors, so on and so forth. And then our signals uh, have a, a trigger, an external trigger, which corresponds to uh, protons on target. The, uh, the, this is the moment in time where the protons are striking the mercury at the SNS and generating the neutrinos. And uh, we look uh, at the time, the 10 microseconds before and after. We impose some cuts based on what's happening at earlier times. And everything is done identically for these two periods of time, the 10 microseconds after protons on target and the 10 microseconds before. So what we're doing with this is every time the SNS triggers, we have an opportunity to see if we're seeing signals, but also to measure the environmental background. Okay, in the in the pre-trace, and this is the money plot. True enough, when the beam is off, if we take the residual between the signals after protons on target and before, we see the fluctuations around zero that you would expect to see. There shouldn't be any difference in environmental backgrounds between the two periods of time, and there you go. 
And then when the beam is on, we get a characteristic excess in both time and energy, as I mentioned before. And uh, what's cute is that this signal there is not a fit. This is the standard model prediction. This is the histogram is, is the straight up standard model prediction, which agrees with what we measure uh, within uh, one signal. Um, these are the backgrounds. What's also nice about this first measurement is the high signal to background. This tiny little orange square there, and you can barely see it spread out in energy here. That is all that we are showing here as, as far as background So it, it, it's, it's been a rewarding measurement from the point of view of it's rather clean. In a year or so, we'll have twice as much statistics, lower uncertainties, and that will be our f final noise about this particular target. We also observe a very nice correlation with the instantaneous energy, uh, the instantaneous power being delivered to the target, how this signal forms in time as a function of that power. Okay, so I'm at the end of my talk. I just have one more minute. I want to communicate the difficulties in doing uh, something interesting out of all this. Up until this point, at least for me, this has been sort of a sport. We wanted to get here before the competition, uh, but um, from this first result, for instance, we got some limits on non-standard interactions from neutrinos, but that's not uh, earth shattering or anything. Sevens is going to allow us to do much more than that, but we are going to need to know our detectors so much better than what we've done so far for dark matter studies. For instance, I, I promised I would mention something about electromagnetic properties of the neutrinos. This is for a germanium detector. These are the recoil energies that we expect to produce in, uh, at the SNS. And if you want to improve on our present sensitivity to the magnetic moment, uh, sure enough, uh, there's some signals that start to diverge from the standard model prediction, but notice the energy scale. These are all sub-KV. So if you want to see these, these all the possibilities, you need to do uh, spectroscopy, you need to measure energies very accurately below 1 keV, and you need to understand these quenching factors to the few percent level. So, so this is quite a challenge. I mean, people uh, outside of this field perhaps don't appreciate the, the difficulties involved. We do have one technology that may be able to, uh, to pull this off, and this is this P-type point contact detectors. This is the present state of the art, uh, the energy resolution we get out of a few kilogram detector these days and the sort of threshold we can achieve. So it, it, it is going to be able, but it's going to take a lot of work. And next week we're putting in a proposal. The NSF will tell us if they, if they like this approach or not. Uh, there's been a lot of R&D done in industry where we have been able to build larger and larger PPCs with smaller and smaller noises, meaning better and better energy resolutions and lower and lower energy thresholds. And essentially what we are about to build, if we get the funding, is something that is off the shelf these days, thanks to the R&D that was done to develop these detectors for uh, dark matter detection. Uh, and finally, we need to understand these quenching factors. As I said, very, very well. This is the quenching factor for germanium. Before you were looking at the quenching factor for cesium iodine. And, uh, uh, the last measurement we perform of this kind is this band. Looks like a fit to the data, uh, existing data. But right now, we have four ongoing new quenching factor measurements in Germania within the coherent collaboration in this energy range. OK? Uh, this is a result from last year. And you can see that this year, this is still not published. But we are already measuring lower energies, sub-KV energies, with some of these monochromatic neutron sources. In order to do all of this interest in neutrino physics, we need to know these quenching factors to the few percent level or better. So the challenge is very, very high if we want to exploit the sevens for neutrino physics. And I think I'm going to uh, stop uh, here uh, before we run out of time. Some of our colleagues are developing even fancier recoil uh, detectors, uh, nuclear recoil detectors. This is the work of one of my postdocs, who's now faculty in Northwestern, uh, Eric Dahl. Uh, and he has, for instance, 
expanded the bubble chamber technique into also measuring scintillation. Not only he's detecting acoustics, uh, he has this intrinsic rejection of nuclear recoils by using the right degree of superheat. He's now also measuring scintillation, which gives us an additional handle. Uh, and the idea is to bring these devices to the SNS because the scintillation actually give us, gives us the timing information we require. So nuclear recoils were an old shoe, started you know, in the 1920s with Chadwick, but we're now down to, as you can see, much more sophisticated low energy nuclear recoil detectors. And what we can see with this, still to be seen. I keep telling Rick to move to sevens because at least there's a signal there that can be measured and it's predictable. <laughs> He, Rick here has never measured anything like myself until last year. Okay, and uh, I can tell you, there's pleasure to be extracted from knowing where the signal is and see it uh, grow up like that. So, if you want to join coherent? Uh, you know where we are. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk, very nice. I do have uh, one question, more probably two. So by saying QR less than one, you mean that um, all of the possible Q values multiply R less than one, right? The, the, Q, the Q values, what do you mean by the Q? Q is the momentum transfer? Ah, no, no, uh, that, that's in natural units. So the, the inverse of the, of the uh, momentum transfer has to be smaller than the radius of the nucleus. Right, right. Well, I'm asking this because comparing to the the new neutrino case experiment that you have done, but the dark matter, dark matter. If we we assume the dark matter is a 100 GV, we, you know. Yeah, but the, the and speed, then the, uh, it's moving at 300 kilometers per second. Right. The the the, the, the maximum uh, momentum would be like 200 MeV each, right? That means if you calculate the Q and R, that means it's greater than one. Three to six yeah. depends on the the, the material. But that means the wimp and the and the, and the, and the detector and the matter would not be a, a coherent star scatter. A very high mass one TeV wimp will start to lose coherence, and this is why you when you calculate your differential energy recoil spectrum in dark matter studies, you throw in a form factor, a nuclear form factor to take into account the loss of coherence. So yes, at very high wind masses uh, moving at 600 kilometers per second, you do have some decoherence happening. But you can calculate this, and we do. When, when you generate this uh, nuclear recoil spectra, we, we do take into account the law of coherence at very high masses. For a 1 GeV wimp, essentially, it doesn't matter <laughs> what speed it has. It's always fully coherent. Right, well, the, the thing that is, if considering that case, because the, the, the maximum energy is high, well, if we consider that case, the Q max or multiple R is is big, is greater than one. So, so, but the thing is, like the the, the Q max is not always the, the the Q value really transferred in an interaction. That means some of the interaction probably is coherent. Some of the interactions are not. Mm -hmm. It's sort of kind of a mi mixture. I don't think that. That's a good question. Ask this guy. He also works in dark matter. <laughs> uh, if we certainly, so you're saying that, that we should look at the interactions in a one by one case. That in, in sometimes they will be coherent, fully coherent, and sometimes they right. won't. Right. Yes. So that's a uh, you know. For for heavy wimps, he he may be right. Right, but it, because of the one to one mapping in terms of recoil energy to the momentum, it, you can still you just simply adjust the recoil. Yeah, so you, you produce some sort of an average when you throw right. in the form it factor. It does, it does but, analysis, it doesn't cause but I think he's he's right that in, in actuality, in, if you were able to see what happened in each one of the interactions, it would be it would be either fully coherent or not. For the rest of you, this is completely esoteric, and yeah. we're we're talking about hypothetical interactions from hypothetical yeah, particles. Yeah, it's, a good, uh, it's, a, it's a good. It's a good point, but I'm not sure.
That's why I cannot overemphasize but how how important it is that he starts to work on neutrino physics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, sorry, sorry, I have a second question. Is okay? No, we go else. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, PICO. Uh, you didn't mention anything about the spin-independent sensitivity? So I, I don't have those plots to... Uh, your, 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 your envelope will be waiting for you in the usual place. <laughs> so, so the problem in spin-independent searches is that these guys uh, ha are so far ahead from us sure, but that where we're expecting to give them trouble is at low masses. And actually, uh, I do have the plot, the plot that... I, I have the plot right here. And no, that's no, no. I just want to. I mean, I need to communicate that we're doing better than Rick on on, <laughs> on all possible fronts. And uh, for a second there, I, I that was a moment of weakness. I'm sorry. No. So you you can see here how much better we're going to do the, than Rick. Here's 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 Rick-like detectors, uh, uh, and this is us pushing in spin independent, but only at low masses. Now, seriously, what you can see that is that you see where we are compared to them at, at higher wind masses. They, they are, they're, as hard as this is to say for me, they are running circles around us. Right, well, well thank you for pointing that out. The question I wanted to ask was, uh, was about the neutrino floor. I noticed in the spin dependent uh, yeah. plot that your neutrino floor is considerably lower than xenon's. For, uh, for fluorine, yes. Yeah, does that, uh, is that still true for spin independent? It is true, but it's not a plot that I like to. So some of my colleagues show this, and they say, oh, look how much more room we have uh, to go through before we run into this irreducible background. The problem is that with a 500 liter bubble chamber, we're going to be down here. And uh, I don't know. Do you think that we can build uh, detectors 10 times, 10,000 times larger? I don't so, so it's, it's a bogus advantage. Nobody knows how to build a bubble chamber that much bigger. So I, mean, you, you, I think you build it if, say, accelerated data or annihilation data or some other data was positive. I think there's you know, clearly you know, experiment, feasible so, scale experiments. For yeah, and, and, and Rick, Rick would lead us in that effort. Uh, I, I, I will be watching from the audience. You, you will sell that to the funding agencies, right? Well, the reason, and I, I think I first created it about 20 years ago, the progress versus time, and <laughs> actually we talk about more, you know, more, we're, we're dealing more and more, right? Uh, we're, we're going about 30 percent faster than, than your standard Moore's law relationship. Um, you know, the point is we picked a fight with a particular piece of physics where there's eight orders of magnitude uncertainty in the coupling cross-section, just simply because the propagator, that coupling that we need for direct detection has a one over mass of the fourth. <coughs> So if one's going to be really lazy about the, uh, you know, the physics of just two orders of magnitude uncertainty and what the hell's coupling us to this dark side, as it were, uh, gives you eight orders of magnitude uncertainty. So you just, you, you, know, you don't whinge about it, right? <laughs> you, you, you get on and you just simply build detectors that are capable of doing that. And I think, obviously, you, you, know, you have to be careful about the amount of funding that you're asking to do it. But one of the reasons I stopped support, you know, stopped working on some of the previous technologies The end of the road is, 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 is near, be that because we're going to run into the neutrino floor, the irreducible backgrounds from coherent neutrino scattering from known sources of neutrinos, solar or, or atmospheric, or just simply because it'll be unrealistic to propose anything much larger than the next generation. But I, I, you, I, you know, you can, you have 10 tons, we're always doing it, you know, I do it 100 tons, I, I can still see from a cost and performance point of view, you can do 100 tons. A kiloton, I mean, if you talk to Carlo, Carlo, in fact, Carlo's first bid was a kiloton. He didn't even bother with the earlier. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think we, I think obviously it does depend on whether Sorry, next question. Why aren't you using LIDAR? 
say, I, I mean, the acoustics are very cheap, and it's amazing what you guys have done with them. But should, uh, could you get the time structure of the bubble from uh, from light based uh, radar? Well, or just look at the, the timing we, we get. I mean, we, we take images every 10 milliseconds or faster. Oh, right, but I'm actually talking about getting the speed of the expansion of the bubble from the, from the return. Um, that, that wouldn't, but what we've tried to do, uh, there was some progress in Fermilab in measuring the uh, acoustic emission with interferometry on the surface of the glassware. Instead of attaching PSOs, oh, so doing, uh, you know, well, with, we haven't done anything like that. We, we still have room to improve things with standard piezoelectric sensors. We're going to explore that next. Funding allowing. Sorry. Um, so from from the the paper you you submitted to science, um, so you discussed the 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 discrepancy of the events you expected and that you observed, right? The expected number of events is one three one seven three something like this. So observed by the one three four ish. So um, my question is, um, do you think what the what the possible reasons for this discrepancy? This one thing, one question. The second question is. Do you observe the the discrep discrepancy for different neutrinos or roughly the same? You you have you have three neutrinos, right? Events, right? So so I mean for so I, I can tell you so, yeah. so we we are not uh, assigning any importance to the I mean th these two things are overlapping within one sigma the prediction from the standard model and our measurement. We we have three main sources of uncertainty and they all affect all neutrinos the same. One is the, the, our knowledge about the neutrino flux. There you have to rely on, on codes and packages. Uh, and we're thinking of actually trying to measure these things with uh, deuterated water detectors and, and trying to get a, an experimental hold on the neutrino flux. But there's a 10% uncertainty right there. Then there's the quenching factor. You have another order 10% uncertainty. And then statistics, just the fact that we ran for a year. Uh, so by next year, or a year from now, we hope to have at least two of those uh, uncertainties, at least half. And we'll see where that discrepancy goes. But uh, right now, it's perfectly, it's just the, the sum of these three uncertainties that we understand, and that is giving us the small disagreement. Actually, there's a parallel, uh, what, what he's preparing, there's a parallel analysis done in Russia where the standard model prediction and the data are embarrassing, embarrassingly on top of each other. We, we, we don't show that because it's, it's, it's yeah, it's just perfect agreement in, in, the, in the parallel analysis pipeline. Yes. Is, is there any fundamental lower limits for the energy of the new Shino that can be detected in the top chamber? What is the like l lower limit that is limiting, like for example, for the energy of the neutrino or the wimp? Yeah. Uh, neutrinos. Well, so you're talking about the the last slide I showed, uh, where we're thinking of using bubble chambers at the SNS. The limitation there, uh, there we need the light yield to provide us with the timing uh, that we can compare with the uh, SNS signal. And the limitation will, there, will be there, uh, the light we can collect from these very low energy nuclear recoils. This is actually something that Eric and his co colleagues are, are, are experimenting with now. So it's still not clear that we will, be use, be, we'll be, we will be able to use these scintillating bubble chambers at the SNS for, co for coherent neutrino detection, which is what, what I think you're, you're asking about. And sound emission is, uh, with the piezos we have right now, uh, not fast enough to give us the onset of the. Uh, were, were you arguing with respect to the neutrino magnetic moment that this will be something that will be better than all the other techniques, or it brings? Yeah, fortunately for us, for uh, we're. 
for electron uh, neutrinos, we would not be able to improve on the sensitivity, but for the uh, other two flavors, we, we, we can. I mean, it looks like it's feasible if we figure out those quenching factors to the few percent level. So yes, this this because okay, the neutrino scattering from electrons have up to now been the best way of measuring. The, the best limits come from uh, measurements in yeah. with electrons in reactors. Yes, at higher energies, M MeV energies. Okay. So it, it's for the other two flavors that we expect to improve things. <laughs>